Hey there everyone, I'm meteorologist Cassie Nall and this is your 10 weather impact recap for the week. Saturday, March 1st marked the beginning of meteorological spring. In the world of weather, we define the seasons by calendar months and average temperatures. So by the averages, January, December and February are the coldest months of the year, making them winter. Naturally, that makes March, April and May spring. So over the next three months, daylight hours will continue to get longer and our average highs will go from the mid 50s to the low 80s with plenty of ups and downs along the way. Flowers and trees will begin to bloom and there will be allergies for everyone. Current outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center show confidence in above average temperatures overall for the month of March and a chance for near normal to slightly above average precipitation. With the warmer temperatures comes the spring fire season and the beginning of spring severe weather season in the southeast. Unfortunately, the fire season has been off to a very busy start. The state of South Carolina has been dealing with 175 wildfires across the state just over the weekend, with the largest hitting the Carolina forest community inland from Myrtle Beach. That one has now grown to around 1600 acres. Steve Schlick reports on the response from firefighters, police and other residents as they watch flames approach their community. Fire trucks rushing towards a wildfire that broke out on Saturday in Carolina Forest. Karen Lawrence was at lunch when her husband called her. Um, as he got closer, he saw flames behind a house in the woods. He said, let me go, I gotta call 911. Lawrence came home to find smoke filling the air and first responders blocking the road, working to contain that fire. As the evening continued, plumes of smoke became less and less. I'm praying this will get um, under control before it gets too much more out of control. But that fire doubled in size overnight, going from 600 acres to more than 1,200. Dozens of neighborhoods were forced to evacuate, like neighbor Daryl Randolph, who got a knock on the door just after 3 a.m. That's when he saw what was happening. You know, I was like, wow, uh, I think I need to evacuate. As daybreak came, hot spots continued to flare up. I have seen several neighbors putting out fires in their individual grass yards. This fire has covered a lot of ground burning for miles up and down Carolina Forest Boulevard. And as of Sunday evening, there are still some hot spots that continue to burn. But it was Sunday morning when the fire in these woods near West Walkerton Road began to flare up. I didn't realize how bad the fire was. You just hear like a tornado going off in the middle of the trees. It took seconds for that flare up to threaten homes, forcing first responders to go door to door to get people out. Fire's jumping this way right now. Local crews and firefighters from the PD and North Carolina all worked to reduce the fire. Then finally, the sound of relief. Helicopters and air tankers dumped water helping to control the fire. Meanwhile, the Red Cross opened a shelter at the Carolina Forest Rec Center, giving evacuees somewhere to go. And at this time, uh, we're doing our best. At its height, the shelter had over 100 evacuees staying there. And after more than 24 hours of battling those flames, <laughs> crews were able to contain the fire enough for folks to return home. For many evacuees, this was a weekend of uncertainty and shock. But there's one thing that was for sure, their thankfulness for those who work to keep them safe. Very proud of them. Um, they're very um, responsive and um, they, t they took care of us. In North Carolina, U.S. Forest Service fire crews are increasing containment on multiple wildfires in the national forests. Over the weekend, firefighters responded to 13 new wildfires burning approximately 700 acres in total. And in Polk County, a wildfire caused evacuations as flames came very close to homes. Officials are asking people to avoid all activities that could cause a spark and to wait until dry conditions improve before doing any outdoor burning. Now we'd see typically the ups and downs of temperatures during the spring season, and that can often fuel strong storms. March signals the beginning of severe weather season here in East Tennessee. So let's take a little bit of a look specifically at tornadoes. By county, we have seen the most tornadoes since 1950 in Fentress, Cumberland and McMinn counties, which makes sense because typically we have strong systems moving in from the west or from the south. Now you see that higher number there in Blunt and Knox County. We do typically have more tornadoes in these areas, but also a higher population density, which may lead to increased reporting of those tornadoes. Now typically our tornadoes begin as we go into March with the highest number occurring during the month of April. We see a little bit of a downward trend through May and June, but notice that we ramp back up a little bit as we go into fall. We do have a secondary fall severe weather season as those cold fronts start to drop down into 
into the southeast. By the averages, or I should say by looking at history, tornadoes by rating tend to be on the weaker side. In fact, about 85 to 90 percent of the tornadoes that we've had here in East Tennessee have been EF2 or weaker, but that doesn't mean that they're not impactful and we have had stronger tornadoes. In fact, Monday marked five years since the Nashville and Cookville tornadoes in 2020. Late in the evening on March 2nd, a supercell developed in West Tennessee near the Mississippi River and worked its way across the entire state into the early morning hours of March 3rd, dropping 10 tornadoes along its path. The two strongest tornadoes were an EF3 that tracked through the Nashville metro area and east into Wilson and Smith counties, having maximum winds of 165 miles per hour. And then came the Cookville tornado, which was an EF4 with winds of 170 five miles per hour that track from near Baxter close to the downtown Cookville area. Hundreds of injuries and 20 fa 25 fatalities happened that night with 19 of those deaths happening in Putnam County. Incredibly, the EF4 tornado dissipated just blocks west of the heart of downtown Cookville. Reporter Ellis Rold visited Putnam County on Monday and shares how the community has recovered since the 2020 twister. Five years ago, the neighborhood behind me was completely leveled after an EF4 tornado swept through, swallowed 17 homes, killed 19 people, and injured almost 100. For neighbors, they say it's a memory they can never forget, but never want to relive. My son come running in there in my bedroom and says, we ain't at the basement, I hear a tornado coming. Details from a night five years ago, impossible to forget. And we heard like an explosion and we knew the house was gone then. Memories Cookville neighbor Gary Bean recalls year after year. This day every year, you know, it it comes back to us. The EF4 tornado flattened Bean's home. It was a terrible thing to have to go through. And now life is different. Like I said, I hope I don't have to go through it anymore. But every time it comes up the cloud, we we're very conscious of it. Weather now forever at the top of his mind. Like tonight, it's supposed to come a storm late night. I doubt that I'll sleep any tonight. Years later, Bean has rebuilt in the same spot, but has had to do without precious family photos, memories, and keepsakes. Even though we, we rebuilt here, we didn't have anything. Everything was gone. And we had to start from scratch. You know, and I'm 71 years old, and that's not too easy thing to do. You might drive through here and see a normal street, but Mr. Bean says every neighbor and every house have a story from that day. In Cookville, I'm Ellis Rolt. Hundreds of weather forecasters and other federal, national, oceanic and atmospheric administration employees on probationary status were fired on Thursday. The cuts include meteorologists who do crucial local forecasts in the National Weather Service offices across the country. Paul Wagner explains how these cuts could impact all of us. This letter obtained by News 4 was sent to a probationary meteorologist at the National Weather Service and tells the employee they are not fit for continued employment. The letter was sent yesterday to as many as 108 probationary meteorologists working at the National Weather Service. The NWS is one of the components that falls under NOAA. The reduction in force could mean some National Weather Service offices, which are typically staffed 24 hours a day, could be left unstaffed. On most ships, there's only two forecasters on duty. It is very conceivable that there will be not be enough forecasters to keep these offices con continually running 24-7. And um, what will happen to the forecast and warnings uh, is of great concern to us. Within NOAA, Richard Hearn says 500 probationary employees were let go. The primary purpose of NOAA and the Weather Service is protection of life and property. That's a fundamental role of government. And so why cut something that protects people's lives and gives us early warnings for protection of property? Former News 4 chief meteorologist Bob Ryan has spent decades warning viewers of foul and dangerous weather heading their way. It's like a three-legged stool. Take away anyone and it falls apart. And we're dependent on the lead of the Weather Service in issuing the warnings. No private person wants to issue a tornado warning. Project 2025, a Heritage Foundation document, 
described as a roadmap to reshape the federal government, calls for breaking up NOAA and commercializing forecast operations. U.S. Representative Glenn Ivey, whose congressional district includes some NOAA offices, says federal workers are terrified of what's to come. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of anger. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation coming out of the Trump administration. Uh, frankly, you know, it appears that they really are intentionally trying to traumatize federal employees. Representative Ivey says he has some hope the courts will reverse what's already been done to the probationary employees and they will eventually win their jobs back. A church in Irwin now has a new fellowship hall thanks to volunteers. This comes five months after flooding from Helene damaged the original building. Emily Crabtree talked with the volunteers on how they answered the call to help their neighbors in need. We, we of course, framed the walls up and then put the roof on. Uh, that was a two-day project. And then this time we came back uh, yesterday morning started putting vinyl on and building this porch. People tell me that Irwin is nowhere near where it was when Helene hit, but it's also nowhere near where it was before. Church members say that having help for their building means more than they can say. To see this amount of work done in such a small window of time just blows me away. It's, like I said, you just can't put words to it. You know, we are just a small church with very few in number. Couldn't be possible without these gentlemen right here. And they appreciate all of the men who have come out to help. God has blessed each of them to bring them here to help us, you know, so that we can in turn help someone else. You don't know down the road who's going to need help. But the volunteers say they're happy to do it. All throughout this area, there's people needing help, and, and we, just, we just really want to try to help them. The group tells me that helping this church continues to show the volunteer spirit of East Tennessee. Reporting in Irwin, I'm Emily Crabtree. In Cock County, one cafe in downtown Newport is back open after it was destroyed by that historic flooding during Helene. The cafe was only open a few months before the flood, causing major financial strain on the owners. Kendall Ball is the owner of Simple Cafe. He says he's been waiting months for this moment, and the community's support during this time is vital for him to see the silver lining. We had several people coming in and like, hey, are you guys open? And we're like, no, guys, that's tomorrow. So seeing some of those people come in this morning has also been great. Uh, we had a couple customers that were fighting to be our first customer back. Love seeing that. The cafe held a grand reopening Saturday, and dozens of community members made sure to be there when the doors opened. He was bringing a bunch of New Orleans flavors for us who are just moving to this area um, and to find just fresh ingredients and all of that. We were very excited to find this here and visit it as often as we could. I'm just excited to have them back. The cafe is closed on Mondays and Tuesdays and is open 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Wednesday through Sunday. Interstate 40 in Western North Carolina reopened on Saturday for the first time since floodwaters washed away part of the road during Hurricane Helene in late September. Businesses in Hartford say that the reopening of the road makes them excited for tourist season this summer. Avery Gingrich spoke with business owners along the Pigeon River about their plans. Neighbors in Hartford say that quiet streets around here are normal during the winter months. But the aftermath of Hurricane Helene left a weight on this community that brought complete silence. But with I-40 reopening and warmer months just around the corner, neighbors tell me that they expect Hartford to come roaring back. The staff of Smoky Mountain Outdoors are reclaiming their home. It gave me friends, it gave me family, it gave me people that are the most important to me. Heather Ellis is one of them. Hurricane Helene washed away much of her life, but not her love for the Pigeon River. Sweet. Ellis and other rafting guides are starting their season early. They say Hurricane Helene might have a silver lining. Mother Nature has come in, uh, washed parts of the river all the way down to the bedrock. Uh, it's created new rapids. It's created bigger rapids. Smoky Mountain Outdoors owner Daniel Jeanette says the pieces to a brighter future are coming together. He says hundreds of thousands of people raft the Pigeon River yearly. Many of them come through the gorge on I-40. He sees its recent reopening as the latest sign that his team's persistence is paying off. So much traffic 
travelers coming through the gorge that just want to have a place to stay for a night or two. So we're excited to see that business come back. Yes, definitely. The staff at Fox Fire Riverside Campground say they also see brighter days ahead. Helene scarred their land, damaging half their camping sites. But these recent arrivals could be a sign of another summer of adventure. I think before the flood, the argument would be made that Western North Carolina was the best place to live as a kayaker. And uh, between the green, the pigeon, all of these beautiful rivers that we have, the, uh, you had 365 days a year of class one through five paddling. And it was, it was amazing. From Cock County, I'm Avery Gingerich. The National Mall and Memorial Parks has announced some important dates for the Washington, D.C. cherry blossom trees, projecting the peak bloom to fall between March 28th and 31st this year. The famous trees were planted in 1912 as a gift of friendship to the people of the United States from the people of Japan. Each year, the Yoshino cherry trees put on a show, creating gorgeous clouds of white and pink flowers floating around the tidal basin. The timing of peak bloom varies annually depending on weather conditions and usually can occur during the last week of March or the first week of April. Extraordinarily warm or cool temperatures have resulted in peak bloom as early as March 15th in 1990 and as late as April 18th in 1958. The Yoshino trees typically bloom for only several days, making a short-lived scene of splendor that is one of Washington, D.C.'s most anticipated events. Now this Sunday, March 9th, we will spring forward into daylight saving time. The time change was first adopted in World War I as a way to conserve fuel by reducing the need for artificial lighting during the day. And since then, we've been changing our clocks twice a year. The U.S. did briefly try permanent daylight saving time in 1974 and 75, but then repealed it the same year. You may recall back in 2019 that Tennessee passed a law that would have made daylight saving time year round, but those laws can't truly take effect until Congress changes the law, which they haven't been able to do. When we turn our clocks forward one hour on Sunday, the sunset will be at 738 PM that evening. And now let's look at our seven day forecast. We do have some active weather coming Tuesday and Wednesday in the form of a high fire danger, strong gusty winds and even a couple strong storms. Then as colder air moves in, cool and breezy conditions are expected Thursday with Yes, that is a snowflake flurries, maybe in the low elevations, possibly some light accumulations up in the higher elevations. Friday, we get a chance to calm down and take a deep breath as we move into the weekend. Our next weather system moves into the region and don't forget, we turn those clocks forward one hour as we move into Sunday. Thank you so much for watching and remember, you can always get the latest forecast with the 10 news app. It's free to download in the app store.